Welcome to the Black Doctors Talk Podcast. I'm Dr. Sharon H. Porter, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I'm joined by Leonard Sturdivant, a graduate of North Carolina Central University, where he earned a master's in psychology. Mr. Sturdivant has over 10 years experience in the field of marriage and family relationships. Welcome, Mr. Sturdivant. I am so glad to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. So first, I would love for you to start by telling our viewers and listeners a little about your background. And where does it all begin for you? Where does it all begin? Um, my freshman year at North Carolina Central, um, I was looking at all the majors and psychology had an appeal to me simply because I was trying to figure out my family craziness. So it was, <laughs> it was kind of a natural fit and progression for me to get my bachelor's and then on to my master's. And then on to my PhD uh, at Virginia Tech. I'm still in litigation with Virginia Tech because they don't want to give me my doctorate. So uh, we have lawyers and all that stuff tied up and we're fighting for it. And we just brought in the Southern Association of Colleges, which is really going to make this a fun party. So it's going to be interesting. <laughs> okay. So in your over 10 years of working with couples in their marriages, what are some of the biggest problems that you see? There's a myriad of problems. Most of it's intergenerational pathology that has passed down from generation to generation that has not been explored. Uh, the secrets within the family that are really explosive, but it's, it's really funny because there are no secrets in black families. There's only a conspiracy of silence. And when you don't talk it out, you will act it out. And that's where people get into the deepest conflicts because they trigger each other. Families trigger each other, couples trigger each other, individuals can trigger themselves. So um, it's, it's over the years, um, what I'm trying to do is to kind of Put these families back together. I believe families have to heal from the inside out. So uh, my mission is to put Black families back together. Okay, thank you. Now we know that trust is huge in relationships. Um, what are the essential components of trust and how do couples rebuild that trust if it's been broken? Trust. I think uh, and under utilized aspect of trust is that I have to have the capacity to love myself first. If, if I don't know how to love myself, I'll make you take care of me. And, and from that point, it's just a cascade of effects. So first and foremost, if I know how to love myself and you know how to love yourself, we can both come together. Intimacy is based upon equality. You, you, you have to be here. You, you can't be dating up. You can't date down. When you're dating right in here, this is a sweet spot because you, you have mutual respect for each other. Mm -hmm. And the trust from that mutual respect has a chance to flourish when it's not asymmetrical. You know, when, when one person has an advantage, I've got the job, I've got the money, you don't have as much and so you got this gap and that gap can represent all kinds of tension so what i attempt to do is to kind of get couples in this zone where you know they're in this equally yoked kind of zone and and that way especially if they have children because children watch everything that you do yes um when the children see you in a loving relationship, that becomes the prototype in their mind and the model that will dictate their relationships. Okay. So how much do you think social media affect marriages, positively or negatively? If I'm going to lean away, I'll probably say negatively. Uh, inculcation, repetition through learning. If, I, if I'm looking at Housewives of Atlanta, on a regular basis, you kind of open your mind up for some of that stuff to kind of seep in there. 
on an unconscious level, and, and we know that 80% of your decisions are probably going to be on the unconscious level. So what you feed your mind is really crucial in determining your trajectory of your relationship, plus your family background. You know, how did I grow up? Was mom and dad in the house? Did I grow up single parent? What is the relationship between my parents? So those are really important factors in determining how well the couple will be together. And, and that really speaks to media in general, television and watching those things like that. Um, what about specifically your um, social media outlets, such as your Facebook, your Instagram? Um, we know that um, in, in years past, it really caused havoc in some marriages, um, some internet cheating and things of that nature. Um, do you still see that as an issue? Well, if it's a couple, uh, I try to tell them to share the page and, you know, but some couples want, I want my own individual page and you got your own individual page and then, you know, I'm tracking you and you're tracking me. So it, it, it goes can, back to that trust. <laughs> it goes back to that trust. And so, <laughs> and, and, and again, if the trust wasn't established, you know, from the beginning, then, you know, you're going to have all kind of relationships that have past mm. impact into it so um instagram I, I try to post positive images of black mm. men and black women all of, all of the images on my site are black people there are no there are no caucasians on the site and that's for a purpose so that when you see the site you can see yourself mm. so media's impact I would say it, it's, it's fairly significant, depending on how, how much you consume of it. If, if you're on your phone or you're, you know, if you're looking at all of your hits and your likes, you get little <laughs> dopamine charges. And so I, I want to see how many likes I got today versus how many dislikes, you know, it's, it's really crafty because, you know, everybody's starting to turn to media to get, get your dopamine hit. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So what are the benefits of premarital counseling for couples? Premarital counseling cuts divorce down by over 50%. So um, um, I have several couples that are in premarital right now. And, and I pose the really hard questions. So a lot of a lot of my couples are living together. I'm like, well, well, what was the purpose of you living together? Are you trying to save money and trying to get to know each other? They just move in because they thought it was a good idea. So there was no format coming together. You got to have purpose. What is the level of commitment? What are the family of origin issues? Family of origin issues is probably the number one thing I, I delve into because if, if I grew up with mom and dad and my mom and dad are still together and you grew up single parent, mm -hmm. we have a different view of how relationships should go. Right. I've got a prototype in my mind of seeing my parents struggle and make it and hang in there and you have a very different view. So how can we meld these two views in? One of the things I like to do is to get couples to leave home meaning that when, once you leave home you kind of come towards each other if you don't leave home if i'm still playing my role that i grew up if i'm the superstar if i'm the caretaker if i'm the the comedian or the religious one all those are roles to keep my parents together mm. but when i come to you if i keep trying to play those same roles it's going to be problems because wow. we need to form our own family and, and we need to leave family origin so that we can be successful. New roles. I, I, I like that. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, yeah. So how important is practicing the same religion in a marriage? You, you sort of touched on a little bit, you know, about, you know, the sameness, but how important is that? You know, equally, yo, you, 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 you spoke of that. How important is that? I think it's fairly significant when it comes to raising the children because which format are we going to go with? And so if you're a Christian and I'm Jewish or Hindu versus Buddhism, you know, 
how are we going to raise the children? What format are we going to use so that we'll be the guiding light for our children? And, and that can be a source of tension. One of those things that I kind of pick up on in the premarital sessions is that religion is pretty important. But, you know, religion is, is, is multifaceted. It's now people are spiritual. People aren't as dedicated, to, you know, some are religious, some are spiritual. So it really depends on how, how much of that person's upbringing and the religiosity they bring into the marriage those questions probably need to be solved first. And so this is why you come to premarital. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and this is why you get, uh, <laughs> a lot of times I, I pose the really hard questions, you know, how are we going to raise scale as physical punishment, or I don't believe in physical punishment, or I, I believe that children should have a bank account and I don't believe children should have a bank account and I think you should have a car, you know, what about the bar mitzvah, the bath mitzvah, the, the king scenario? I mean, it's, it's, it's all kinds it goes of, on and on, right? it, 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 it gets really convoluted. So, you know, during the premarital sessions, we just kind of sort that out and we kind of list the priorities here mm -hmm. and, and then you touch the triggers, you know, wow. well, my mom did this and, and we ate dinner at two o'clock. Well, we eat dinner at six o'clock. Okay, so you're gonna have to eat dinner at four o'clock. So you, you kind of want to merge. You're, you're literally merging two corporations together. Right, you know, business, religion, how you're gonna raise kids. Hmm. So what are some of the deal breakers in those um, premarital counseling sessions? Have you ever had any deal breakers? Oh yeah. Uh, secrets that I bring into the relationship mm -hmm. from my family. So, uh, a lot of, uh, okay, we grown. So, a lot of incest secrets, mm -hmm. a lot of molestation secrets. Yes. Um, those are devastating, mm -hmm. uh, especially to the person they have to, and that is not, not gender specific. Mm -hmm. uh, it has happened to men as well as women. Wow. So if I don't talk about it, I'll act it out. And a lot of times people act it out on, on the, once you say I do, that starts the party. So wow. up until courtship, you know, you, you could be swinging off the vines and then you say I do. And then it's something mm -hmm. magic happens. And then all of your family stuff starts to come up and out. There's no other place to discharge your family dysfunction other than being in a relationship. Wow. So you, that brings me back to the first response. You talked about the conspiracy of silence um, that um, most people involve themselves in. Um, and I just want to go back. How do you as a counselor, when you're coaching families or, or couples um, to really release that silence? How, how, what are your strategies for that? Well, one of the things I like to do is I like to keep couples together. I think you should learn about the other person, you know, their stuff mm -hmm. and, and what they come from, their background. I think you should learn together. I, I don't like busting couples up and talking to this one individually and talking to this one individually because mm -hmm. I'm not keeping any secrets between clients. So on a rare occasion, I may speak to them, but... Once you get them and, and, and you, you hear the person's background, the stuff that they went through, you develop a kind of empathy for what happened. And the other seed I like to drop is the forgiveness. You know, so mm -hmm. your mom did the best she could. Your dad did the best she could, he could without the resources that you have. And, and to implement that forgiveness. Because forgiveness, you know, a, a parent's apology well, it's better than years of whatever sessions of therapy or counseling you could ever go through. So I, I try to encourage couples to, you know, turn to each other to learn as much about their past as they can. And so I, I go into the deepest parts of whatever past 
whatever secrets that they're, I mean, because secrets are time bombs. Yes. You know? and, and, and after you say I do, then, you know, if you didn't reconcile that secret, then there's going to be trouble. Because the kids will become the burden bearers of the secret. Wow. Right. So whatever that energy is, why kids kids will trigger you yes. to no end. They know exactly, and so you look at these kids, and you're like, wow, what, what, where did you get that from? Yes. So yeah, a, a child will automatically. I mean, they were a part of you. So you know, they, they're you and him. You know, got <laughs> Twenty three right. chromosomes, twenty three <laughs> chromosomes, and so. A, a child will be very triggering if you have not reconciled that secret. That child will take on that secret. And, mm -hmm. and you'll hear stuff like, I don't know where he got that from. I don't know where she got that from. That is amazing. I never, like, okay. Yes. So one of the things I always check on if they have kids is, you know, what are the kids doing? Are the kids keeping the marriage together? Mm -hmm. you know, so I got a superstar here and the superstar's job is to bring honor for the family you know you, you talk to this kid and he's like he's got scholarships all over the place and you know he's on the dean's list honor roll and you ask him how he feels he says well you know my family's my family's proud of me and, and you just see this blank it's like it wasn't for me right because kids sacrifice that part of their lives to keep this man and this woman together Wow. So between a man and a woman, there's this intimacy vacuum. If something's, you know, something's wrong with this man and this woman, these kids will go into action because they rely on these parents. Children deify parents. You can't not do it. You're going to deify your parents, even if they treat you bad. Right. So these kids know that if this man and this woman don't stay together, I'm going to die. Wow. So... If mom cheats on dad or dad cheats on mom, one of these kids will become highly religious. Why? Because what does the family need? The family needs some religion. Maybe that will keep them together. And so you hear these pastors say, I got my calls of mystery a long time ago. I'm like, hmm, I, I wonder what's that about. Yeah, so, that's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. It's, it's, wow. the, the configurations are <laughs> numerous. Uh, you know, this family needs to lighten up so one of the kids will be a comedian. Y'all need to lighten up. If there's enough kids to go around, there'll be multiple roles. Mm -hmm. One kid will be the scapegoat kid. They'll blame everything on this kid. That's his job. Wow, interesting. So in the light of uh, this whole uh, pandemic that we're in, I I'm a K-12 educational leader and social distancing and practicing virtual learning for students have probably presented um, some major challenges for families. Um, what are some strategies families can use as we continue to go through this? Because I, undoubtedly, social and emotional um, aspects are being affected. So what strategies do you have? Well, it's a new normal. So now, and, and this, this is a great season for me because everybody's home. So um, you have to readjust. You have to reprioritize. You know, families that are now forced to be together have to come up with new strategies to do things together, to still be a family and still be loving towards one another. And so one of the strategies I like to use is, you know, family gets together at least once or twice a day, you know, right, maybe around dinner and kind of check in, you know, parents lead that conversation, you know, check in with the kids. How, because this virtual learning thing now, you know, so, so yeah, how, are, how, how was your class today? You know, do you need any help? Parents need to check in with their kids because left unchecked, kids kind of go off on their own tangent. And that begins this cycle of, you know, it depends on how big the family is. You know, I'm an only kid, so it wasn't much action going on. But if you got families that have lots of brothers and sisters, the parents have to take the lead. Mm -hmm. And the parent can take the lead by serving the children. You can't really lead them unless you serve them. Mm -hmm. So parents need to come up with innovative strategies on how they're going to serve their kids. Because your kids will mind you more if you serve them. Awesome. Got to have leadership. <laughs> so what do you consider your greatest strength as a family and marriage coach? 
What are your greatest strengths? Language. I, you know, uh, I, I, I've had folks walk in and say, oh, because you can't look at my name and tell what color I am. So they'll come in and say, I am so glad you're black. I'm like, well, me too. <laughs> so the language, the culture, mm -hmm. all that, you know, we can just bypass all this. So I don't have to get to know all that about you. I've been poor, I've been in the projects, I've been well off, I've had nice stuff, I've had been dirt poor. So it's, it's like I, I've, I've hit the entire range, you know, mm -hmm. educationally, emotionally, physically. Mm -hmm. I've, I've pretty much seen the gamut. So uh, a lot of my experience that I bring into the room is is one of the greatest assets because I, I don't have to do all the joining and I don't do the therapy. That's kind of corny. So I don't, I, I've avoided all of the <laughs> traditional therapeutic stuff that I had to run through my black filter and it came out very different. Because you cannot take white data, superimpose it on the black people and think that the trajectories are going to be the same. Wow. I don't know that quickly. So uh, everything is, I, I, had to, I had a paradigm shift because mm -hmm. what I learned in school was not really applicable, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, because the data was white, the, the researchers were white, the subjects were white, and then, you know, they'd sprinkle a couple of, you know, black people in their study and say, hey, we got some black people, but it was never significant enough to be meaningful. Wow. It sounds like um, being relatable um, is something that you really bring to the table, um, that you can relate to the individuals that come to you for assistance. Sure. That's 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 key because when they look at me, they can see themselves. Mm -hmm. I love that. And that, to for me, you know, all all my doctors are black. All of them, dentist, foot doctor, eye doctor, all of them. Because when I go in there, I see myself in them. So, uh, and I know, I know, uh, and there are people who are for you know white therapists, and I had a great experience, and that's cool. But you know, this is a new normal. You know that 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 old standard is about to fall by the wayside now because now we we have we have we now have another choice, and and people who are conscious are executing that choice vigorously. Wow. So how and when did you realize that your niche was actually in counseling for family and marriages? When and, and how did that come about? Because my parents were crazy. My parents were both alcoholics. Well, wow. my dad was narcissistic as all get out. And I needed to understand that train wreck that I came from. Mm. So I'm real comfortable. In, and not a lot of folks can do couples. They could be in the lobby about to scratch each other's eyeballs out of them. Y'all come on in. <laughs> I don't get caught up in, you know, it doesn't trigger me like that. Because wow. that's what I grew up with. Wow. So that that kind of let me know that that was my niche that mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, because I, I have other therapist friends tell me, saying, you can take all of my couple. I'm like, yeah, I'll take them. Doesn't bother me. Wow. So. And I can imagine that it would be a little more uh, difficult than an individual coming to you for some coaching or counseling versus two people coming as a couple that are going at it. Um, because I can, you know, I, and I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the time, probably outside of pre-marriage counseling, they're coming to you because there is an issue. Um, there is a problem. <laughs> yeah, and, and, the, the, and the number one thing that is cited is we, we, we don't communicate. <laughs> it's not that you don't communicate. It's that the receiver doesn't want to hear the message. Mm. People who spend that much time together mm -hmm. if, if, the, if one says something about it it's probably going to be fairly accurate can i receive it that's the problem because the, the couple see each other i, I see your stuff mm -hmm. you know and and if you're going to call me out on my stuff well then we just need to we we're, we're not communicating well <laughs> so it's usually something uh, along that lines of oh, okay <laughs> so, you know, and you speak of communication because we know that is definitely one of the uh, reasons why uh, couples say that they don't get, you know, get along that money, kids, money, kids and communication, I think are <laughs> probably right there high up on the list. 
Um, so when it is a communication, because I think you brought a very valid point that it's not necessarily the communication, but it's the receiver um, of what is being said. Um, how do you work through that with couples? Because, I, you know, now that you say that, that's probably absolutely true. I just don't want to hear what you're saying. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> and, and even though you're fairly accurate, I don't want to believe that about myself. Right. Oh, my goodness. So, uh, so have you been successful in reaching couples through that whole communication piece? Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things I, this is why I don't do therapy. So one of the things that I have discovered, especially with black folks, is that I don't do the 50 minute, oh, I'm sorry, we're done. What I have learned, my data seems to suggest that mm -hmm. right at 50 minutes, that's, you, you just get ready to hit cruising altitude. Mm -hmm. and, and so the work is done up here in the stratosphere. Here's where the work's done, not in the liftoff. And so, you know, I, and, and when I was forced to do it, like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, th that's all of our time. You're not going to remember where we left off. The, the, the magic of what I do is repetition. You have to say it enough times, 27 times in a row, <laughs> in order to create a new, the neuroplasticity to have another thought about it. So... Um, I think it's really funny that uh, <laughs> that the repetition is, is, is what gets you there. You, you, this isn't a one-time, oh, I'm just going to come in, I'm going to get it one right. time. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Definitely. But that's why, that's why I do two hours. Okay. All of my sessions are two hours. Two hours. Okay. Oh, what are we going to talk about for two hours? I have been in the room for three and a half hours. Wow. So, so once, I mean, because once you're here, once you're at cruising altitude, this is where the work comes out. Mm -hmm. Here's where the secrets come out. Yep. Here's where all of your family stuff comes out. You're not going to get there. Yeah, I love that. The take. I love that. Yes. You're not. Yeah, I love that. And, and, wow. and then you pay $150 for 50 minutes. That's not, that don't work. I love that. Yeah, the work comes after all of that. Yeah, you got to get, you got to, it's lift off, mm -hmm. you know. Tell me about your week. Tell me what happened. You know, what happened at work? That's another, that's a whole nother ball of wax. You know, what happened to you at work? You need to discharge that energy. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what she did to me. I'm, she, I'm about, I mean, I mean, it's just like word vomit and wow. you feel better. And that's, that's, that's 40 minutes right there. Wow. Just talking about what happened to you at work, your supervisor, yeah. people you supervise, you know, your work is people trying to undermine you. You know, you got a you got a white boss, you got somebody that's narcissistic, you got an affair going on. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff. That's just at work. If I don't leave it at work, I'm gonna bring it home. And guess what? I'm gonna take yeah. it out on the person who's closest to me. Yeah. Interesting. Oh my goodness. This is this is really great. So how has your affiliation um, with the Black Doctorial Network enhanced you professionally? I, I, I went for five years in a row. Uh, <laughs> I was there in the, the initial uh, session, uh, initial conference, mm -hmm. and, and I, it was only last year. I think I, I missed last year because I'm, I'm dealing with Virginia Tech and all of this stuff. And... Um, I mean, and now the COVID, but I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, but I, I love it because I, I got to see people who look like me. Uh, all of the conferences, are, uh, all of the workshops mm -hmm. were cutting edge stuff that was being conducted by black researchers. And, and that's important for me because a lot of them use black, you know, black subjects. And, and so you're getting cutting edge stuff right as it's coming off of the press and, and you get to ask the researcher the questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I just thought it was, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm coming out of one session, trying to catch another session. <laughs> the sessions yeah. were so good. It was like, right. oh, wow. and, and, you know, I needed to record this one. And, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of going in and out because there's some folks that I needed to see. It was some research that I needed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, to, so that I could go back to, you know, my, my clients and, and, you know, by learning new things and exactly. learning what the cutting edge stuff was. So uh, the Black Doc on Network has been enormously helpful for my trajectory. Because I, I learned a lot. I got my first book chapter uh, at the Black Doctor on okay. Network. Okay. Uh, White Validation Syndrome. 
Okay, tell us about that. <laughs> White Validation Syndrome, that's a, we, we gonna be here a while. <laughs> just a little bit, tell us just uh, a little bit. <laughs> White Validation Syndrome is the proximity to whiteness. That the closer I can get, the more proximal I am to whiteness, I'm okay. Mm. I will sacrifice my soul, my integrity, you know, all of that stuff that makes me who I am. I will set that to the side because I'm, I'm, I'm being proximal to whiteness. Code switching, mm -hmm. ass kissing, brown noses, sycophantic behaviors are all the weaponry wow. <laughs> that, you know, white validation. You know, I, I soften my features. I cut off all of my facial hair. I, I don't, I, you know, black women wear their hair straight, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm going to play the game, then because mm -hmm. I don't want to upset these people, and if I want to gain some proximity to whiteness, I've got to modify who I am. Wow. Wow. That's a, that's a whole nother discussion okay. right there. <laughs> Wow, interesting. I love that. Well, Mr. Sturdivant, I tell you, I thank you uh, for joining us today. It has been my pleasure. Uh, can you please tell our viewers and our listeners where they can learn more about you and the work that you're doing? Uh, I have the domain and the website up. It's called marriagefamilyclinic.com. That's me, and you'll come to my website. And it's very blackity black. So uh, <laughs> you can, uh, my contact information is there. You can call me or email me. And uh, I do, uh, as a, you know, if you're interested, what I do is a free 10, 10 15 minute intro. You know, that's for everybody. You know, you know, what about this? What about that? What about, you know, people, you know, I get a lot of first timers. You know, I ain't never been in no therapy. I ain't never been in no coaching. I've never been in any of it. Mm -hmm. and, and I love first timers because I want to give them that positive experience mm -hmm. so that they can, you know, begin to incorporate, you know, the resources that are available. It's real important. Awesome. So please be sure to stay connected to the Black Doctoral Network and connect with us on all social media channels. Okay. We want to thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, and we hope you will join us again next time. But for now, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and tell a friend.